Good morning, everybody. Welcome. It's my pleasure to welcome you today to a session focused on U.S.-Russia conflict and international secu security uh, with uh, opening remarks by Matthew Rojansky. Uh, let me do a bit uh, let me do a bit to set the stage before we turn to the subject. Uh, this is a return visit for our speaker today. He was last with us almost exactly four years ago uh, in, in, in which he gave a, a talk uh, to help us understand President Putin's grand strategy and its tactical, tactical elements uh, and to help focus our thinking on the necessary strategic response by the United States. Uh, and it, in, in that session, he focused on a fine essay done for the NATO Defense College, exploring the relevance of George Kennan's work on containment in the 1940s for the big strategic problem of the 2010s. Uh, the intervening four years in U.S.-Russian relations have unfolded, have unfolded in ways that really no one could have predicted. Let's invoke Charles Dickens. It's been the best of times and also the worst of times. Presidents Putin and, and Trump both said they wanted to improve relations, uh, and they had a, uh, have, ha have had a, an improved relationship between the two of them, yet the overall situation between our two countries has clearly continued to deteriorate. And today in Washington, uh, newcomers must again be looking for that darn reset button. Uh, every new administration has come in and sought to reset uh, policy towards Russia and to put things back on track and find the silver lining in the dark skies. And, uh, and a central part of Matt's message today is that, today is that we, sh we shouldn't give up on finding that uh, silver lining on, uh, because it's possible uh, to put our bilateral relationship with Russia onto a more solid footing and to start moving again in a more positive direction. Uh, and this note of cautious optimism is a welcome addition to a debate that's that's otherwise quite quite sour. Uh, Dr. Matthew or Mr. Matthew Rojansky is director of the Kennan Institute at the Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars in Washington, D.C. Uh, he served previously as deputy director of the Russia and Eurasia program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, he has also served as an embassy policy specialist at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev, Ukraine, uh, and as a visiting scholar at the NATO Defense College. He currently also serves as an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins University's School of Advanced International Studies in Washington, D.C. He has an undergraduate degree in history from Harvard University uh, and a law degree from Stanford University. Matt, thank you so much for making the time to join us. Uh, I hope our connectivity works this morning well enough to, to enable us to get through this session successfully. To review for the group, group before I turn it over to Matt, uh, Matt will speak for uh, 30 to 45 minutes uh, with, with PowerPoint slides. Uh, and then uh, we will turn to the question and answer session, broader discussion. Uh, and if you'd like to join the discussion at that point, which will be off the record, uh, please submit a question in the chat function, sending it to me, uh, or um, put your hand up electronically and we'll, we'll call on you. So without further ado, Matt, thanks so much for making the time to join us today. Over to you. Okay, great. Uh, can you guys hear me now? Yes, yes. we can. Yes, here All you right, go. super. Uh, well, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, uh, Brad, and I, I very much uh, regret not being with you in person, uh, not least because uh, I am a native of uh, the Bay Area. I, I grew up literally visiting the lab uh, when I could and how I could because my grandfather uh, worked there, uh, and that is why I exist, because he moved the family out from, uh, from Brookhaven, Long Island, to uh, work uh, at Lawrence Livermore. So. Uh, it's near and dear to my heart. Um, this pandemic and, and all the uh, limitations it imposes uh, is another story, and I'm going to try to um, uh, speak to you from my notes uh, while sharing a full screen PowerPoint with you. I beg your forbearance uh, in case it is uh, less elegant than Katie and I pictured it uh, in our prep session, uh, but here goes nothing. Wait, hang on. Nope. 
See, now I forgot to actually share the screen. I'm going to share the screen and then, okay. So share. All right. Now uh, you, you all should see my PowerPoint. I'm going to go to slideshow view. All right. So hopefully you see our, our friend uh, Volodya there clutching the microphone and inspiring all of us. So uh, I, uh, you good? See it? Yes. All right, great. So yeah, so uh, as Brad said, uh, you know, I have a background as a, a Russia area studies guy and, uh, you know, my credentials in that field plus uh, $3.49 will get you a, a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So uh, that's about what it's worth uh, these days. Um, but I do want to draw a little bit on um, some of what I learned about in the education that Brad talked about. Uh, and, and talk a little bit about what I see as kind of the power of social science to help us understand the psychology of the relationship as a foundation for the policy landscape. Uh, so I want to introduce a, a concept that you've likely heard of before uh, called fundamental attribution error. Uh, it's credited to Lee Ross at Stanford in 1977, uh, where he defined it as the tendency to believe what other people do reflects who they are. Uh, as opposed to, of course, explaining your own behavior based on circumstance and need and exigency. Um, the variation I'd introduce here is to say that we see what the other does in the context of the U.S.-Russia relationship, but we supply our own reasons for why he does it, and this gets us into a logic of escalation in the relationship. So uh, I will uh, I'll walk us through this and sort of explain how it works. Um, you know, again, none of this is none of this is intended to be an argument or, or controversial. This should be recapping stuff you've heard a million times. Uh, so see if these statements sound familiar. You know, Americans tend to uh, believe that Russia is in conflict with the United States, with Western democracies and with its post-Soviet neighbors uh, because of the nature of its government. So think about the following claims. Uh, Russia seeks to undermine American democracy because such a system is inherently threatening to Putin's kleptocratic, authoritarian, nationalist regime. That should not be a, a, a far bridge to cross. We've heard that a lot of times. Uh, there's a lot of truth to it. Uh, Russia behaves in an aggressive way towards its neighbors because the Kremlin cannot tolerate the flourishing of freedom and democracy or integration into Western institutions in those neighbors. Again, not, not an outlandish claim. You've probably heard it many times. It's been baked into many uh, official U.S. policy documents. Um, so here's the rub. The, the Kremlin and President Putin uh, receive consistently more public support and approval on foreign and security policy than on other issues like economic and social issues, dealing with corruption in Russia, uh, you know, all kinds of issues where, where they fall short. Foreign and security policy is not one of them. So there are two possible logical conclusions to this, and they're both bad from a U.S.-Russia relations standpoint. Uh, one is that the Russian people are so manipulated and deceived by their government that the only solution to our disagreements is a change of that government. That might actually be analytically correct, and you often p hear people hinting at this when they talk about kind of, we just have to wait Putin out, uh, but that is dangerous territory for foreign policy, as we'll discuss. Uh, and the second possibility is that the Russian people actually genuinely agree with their government's aggressive foreign policy. Uh, and so our problem is not with the nature of the government, with Putin, it is with the nature of the Russian people. Also, obviously, problematic territory for foreign policy. Either way, we're left with basically one policy option, which is to raise the costs on Russia for its authoritarianism and or its aggressive behavior uh, and hope for better outcomes. But that's obviously the triumph of hope over, over experience. Let's see if you can uh, get to the next slide. And, you know, a great example of that is obviously uh, sanctions policy. Um, the Russians explain in a very similar fundamental attribution error kind of way, uh, American values and principles driven foreign policy as being at best, a kind of affectation or propaganda or hollow rhetoric, uh, but in any case, as some kind of cover for our real motivations, which they say are geopolitical, military, and economic. Uh, we are, in fact, a power-hungry hegemon and a bully in the Russian telling and the Russian explanatory belief about who we are and why we do what we do. Um, moreover, Russians understandably believe that Russia matters, right? It matters to them. Uh, so they believe it probably matters to us. And we tend to reinforce that belief when we say Russia all the time in media and public debates, even when our use of the word Russia isn't really about Russia, right? Like Moscow Mitch, right? No one really thinks that Mitch McConnell, you know, is, is some kind of Russian agent. It's about American domestic politics. 
Uh, but the Russians conclude, we really care about Russia if we're always talking about Russia. But here's, the, here's the, pr uh, the problem on this side of the logic, is that if Russia matters to us, but we nonetheless do lots of things to punish, isolate, contain, constrain Russia, like sanctions, which I've mentioned, uh, kicking Russia out of the G8, uh, you know, European reassurance and NATO, et cetera, things that invariably and, and in some respects intentionally uh, damage or limit relations, then it must be the case that we want Russia to be weak, defeated, and disrespected. After all, uh, when we talk about constraining Russia or when we talk about the impact of U.S. punishments, U.S. sanctions on Russia, um, generally, at least in non-classified public settings, the only real impact that the U.S. government can point to is damage to the Russian economy. And that is very real. Uh, so again, when that is described as an accomplishment of U.S. policy, that seems to confirm the fundamental attribution error on the Russian side that this is what we want. We want to hurt Russia. We want Russia to be weak and we want Russians to be contained. Um, so if Americans want to do this to Russia, then from the Russian perspective, the best way to try to deter us is exactly what we conclude, raise the costs, right? Except they don't have the ability to raise the costs by uh, leveraging the global trading and economic system. So instead, they seek asymmetric areas where they can do so. And, and we know about many of those areas, including obviously troll factories and hacking and active measures and so on. So we have two totally different understandings of one another's motivations. Uh, we do not effectively talk to one another anymore about the fundamental drivers of our behavior. And we each try to raise the costs for one another, uh, which in the end doesn't change any behavior, quite the opposite. It reinforces our fundamental attribution error and tends to lead us to a cycle of escalation. Uh, so basic question, how far has it gone? Are we in a new Cold War? Um, you know, it's good news and bad news, right? There are definitely some similarities. There's a basic distrust uh, that's very prevalent in this time period. Russians don't trust their own leaders, just like in Soviet times. But unlike in Soviet times, they also don't trust our leaders. Uh, living with coercive state power and with the reality of a deep state in Russia uh, means you're very inclined to believe in conspiracies, whether local or global. global. And uh, Lord knows there are plenty of conspiracies that involve the United States in the Russian telling, and there are plenty of conspiracies that involve the Russians in the American telling. Uh, Americans, as I'm sure everybody has noticed, are preoccupied with sort of the scheming, all-powerful Vladimir Putin lurking around every corner, perhaps so powerful he can even control an American president, right? Uh, even when Russia does something that should be thought of as just objectively good, humanitarian, right? Like, you know, sending needed medical supplies amid a pandemic, uh, it is covered in a cynical way. The Russians must be up to something. So this is all very reminiscent of kind of Cold War boogeymanism. Uh, Masha Gessen, the New Yorker author, has talked about, uh, who, by, with whom, by the way, I often disagree on policy, but I think she's very correct when she talks about how Putin phobia has, in a way, transitioned to a broader Russophobia uh, in America. And I'll never forget this famous moment uh, in one of the hearings uh, around uh, Trump and, and Russia and that sort of thing, where a Capitol Hill uh, investigator actually asked someone, uh, you know, have you ever had any contact with a Russian or someone with a Russian accent? You know, that's a very scary moment for 2017 or 18 or whatever it was. Uh, Russians, once again, and, and many of you who work on this will know that, view the United States as the main enemy, right? The Predpolagami Pratyvnik or the Glavne Vrag, if you want to be uh, more crude about it. Um, we're engaged in zero-sum narratives, right? There are low or no expectations for cooperation, even though we obviously have areas of common interest, just as we did even in the darkest days of the Cold War. Uh, space, medicine, counterterrorism, perhaps even cyber. Uh, we're engaged in this sort of automatic tit for tat, right? I don't just mean, you know, there has to be a consequence when the other side acts, lest something further bad happen, right? That's kind of rational, that's based on uh, basic deterrence or game theory, but rather the automatic tit for tat, the sort of doomsday machine uh, of punishing one another. Uh, we're engaged in that once again. Um, unrealistic expectations of total victory in a zero sum contest, right? Generally speaking, between human beings, again, it's a kind of a statement of social psychology. When you're engaged in a zero sum, it's not realistic to expect total victory, uh, but our past experience or our salient memories shape that expectation on both sides, but it's different. Uh, for us, we won last time, but the last time that's salient is the end of the Cold War, 1989, 1991. For the Russians, they won last time. And you know, if I were with you in person, I would say, what do you think their salient memory is? It's World War II, of course, right? That's why you have this cult of World War II memory. It is the last great Russian-Soviet victory, and that is the most salient last time, the most salient historical memory to which they peg their identity and their motivations. 
Uh, we're engaged in proxy conflicts again with a, an expert group like this i probably don't have to go through the list but you know suffice to say it sort of starts with the post-soviet space ukraine georgia uh belarus etc and it runs all the way through much farther flung places as far as as far away as the middle east and venezuela uh, but then even closer to home in the sense of you know within u.s domestic politics arguably and certainly in europe where we know for a fact uh, that while the united states is close partners and allies uh with with uh, national governments the Russians may actually be backing financially uh, and in other ways opposition parties. So that, that's a proxy conflict. That is a classic definition of a proxy conflict. Uh, real risk factors abound. So the near misses that we've seen uh, at sea, in the air, et cetera. Um, you know, I just suffice to say we're rolling the dice every time with these things. Um, okay, so that's mostly, I'd say, pretty bad news, the ways in which this is similar to a Cold War. Um, there are important differences. Uh, we are not coming out of the Stalinist 1930s as we were at the beginning of the Cold War in the 1940s, right? We're coming out of an unprecedented period of Russian-U.S. engagement uh, and Russian global engagement. Uh, and this, in a way, is why sanctions have had such a big impact. Uh, even though less than 1% of Russia's GDP involves the U.S. service sector, it's denial of access to that sector that has had perhaps as much, according to recent uh, social science data, as 8% uh, uh, impact cumulatively on Russia's GDP since 2014. That's a huge impact, right? Uh, obviously, other factors have been at play, but that trying to, trying to control for the slide in energy prices, et cetera, we nonetheless come up with you know, nearly a tenth of, of Russia's economy hammered by sanctions. Uh, so that is actually testament to Russia's global integration. Um, Post-Soviet Russia, you know, it's... It's not uh, the land of milk and honey, but on the other hand, it's a lot freer and it's a lot more prosperous than the Soviet Union was uh, at the comparable period. And the post-Cold War generation has established real connections with one another. So if you, you concentrate on people whose formative experiences were not in the 1960s, 70s, or 80s, um, you actually find a really different psychology uh, on behalf of the younger generation. Uh, a great example, of course, is the 2018 World Cup where over 30,000 Americans, most of them young people, uh, because soccer is just more popular with young people, um, uh, you know, I'm more of a football fan myself, but, uh, you know, went to Russia, saw no problem with that, happily accepted the, uh, the free visa that was allowed. Compare that to the Cold War, right? The, the, the reciprocal boycotts of the 1980 and 1984 Olympic Games, et cetera. Uh, moreover, the current conflict lacks uh, what I'd call a universalist global ideological component. It's not that there isn't an ideological element, there is, uh, especially in election interference uh, and, ex and general operations on the Russian side to exploit uh, fissures in US politics and, and arguably on the US side uh, when we do democracy promotion, when we condemn uh, you know, Putin and his regime for being anti-democratic, abusing human rights. But, but these are not like in the Cold War. In the Cold War, uh, there was a big idea that the entire world was supposed to latch itself to that would come with sponsorship, with support in the form of military aid, in the form of development aid, sometimes in the form of actual boots on the ground from either the red team or the blue team. And all you had to do was kind of raise the flag and we'd show up and we'd embrace your future and make it our own, right? Nobody's got an appetite for that today. That's not what this conflict is about. It's an important difference. Um, even RT, right, the infamous RT of Margarita Simonyan, um, it's significant to me. Their motto is not Russia is right. Their motto is not, you know, the dawn of communism is just over the horizon. Their motto is question more, right? So it's about breaking down what they view as a dangerous consensus uh, rather than building something up with a universalist uh, uh, utopian ideology. So neither, neither Russia nor the United States, I guess is the, the takeaway message here, is ready to own the global future. Uh, even when we sometimes suggest that in our rhetoric, there's really nothing backing that up. Um, both sides have extremely reduced capabilities. Uh, you look at the collapse of U.S. investment uh, in expertise on Russia. There was a 2017 study that showed approximately four new PhDs per year that have at least 25 percent content uh, regionally focused on Russia. Four in the United States of America. I mean, that's kind of appalling. Uh, you know, Russia's foreign agent laws. Right. They may be great if you're a KGB police state, uh, you know, moving towards the North Korea model, uh, putting a bullseye on anybody who has any traffic whatsoever with Americans or Europeans. Uh, but it's also a fantastic way to cut off your knowledge and understanding of what's really going on in the outside world. Um, and then in, in 2018, you know, talk about tit for tat. The United States reciprocated with an executive order that barred, quote unquote, Russian state 
employees from participating in U.S. exchanges. Now, uh, if you run exchanges like I do and you know anything about the Russian educational system, you know that all their universities are state universities, pretty much. So you've just barred like every single professor and every single graduate student from participating in exchanges. It's, uh, it's a problematic logic, to say the least. And then obviously, I don't have to go through the, the details of the tit for tat closure of consulates, uh, the wait time for visa interviews going through the roof, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but here's the single biggest difference between now and the Cold War. It's the massive power imbalance, right? Those of you who are sitting in California right now, or like me who wish you were sitting in California, will appreciate this particular graph. Uh, it's a few years old, but you know, uh, the, if anything, the numbers have gotten more extreme than this. You know, Russia's economy is literally smaller than that of the state of California. Um, you know, uh, compared to 1980, when maybe the U.S. GDP uh, outclassed the Soviet Union by a factor of two, maybe three. You know, today it's a factor closer to 20, right? It uh, gives you a sense that the perception of one another as equals, whether that matches the reality, and in some areas it does, in some areas it doesn't, uh, the perception is gone, right? And that really changes the dynamic of this relationship. Uh, and I, I would argue brings us closer to the kind of risk of unintended escalation, simply because we don't wake up every day thinking about one another and how to avoid uh, that undesirable outcome. So I would say there's no more rational fear as there was in the Cold War, and rational fear can be a helpful thing. Um, all right, just a, a couple of comments on kind of world order, the role of China. Uh, China's clearly a great power benchmarking opportunity for, for a Russia that no longer wishes to benchmark to the United States for the reasons we just went through. Um, the rhetoric is idealized. It's clearly fairly hollow. For those of us who learned diplomatic Russian, you hear a lot of those phrases, you know, like nas navanya rabna pravia, right? Like on the basis of equality, blah, de, blah, de, blah. There's a lot of that nonsense. Uh, you know, Putin talks about a relationship of real friendship and mutual respect, uh, interest-based solutions to joint problems. And of course, what really brings the two together is, is opportunistic, right? It's implicit rejection of U.S. hegemony that is baked into everything they do and say. That said, they are building an infrastructure for real cooperation, if not yet an alliance, right? The power of Siberia pipeline is, is truly redrawing the Eurasian energy map. Uh, the naval exercises that they've conducted in the two very sensitive regions of the Baltic and the South China Sea uh, demonstrates a, a desire, if not yet a full capability for both of them to have a joint global reach. Um, the joint development of a wide body jet for commercial aerospace, although right now that doesn't seem like a great uh, a commercial prospect, it will be again eventually, and that's a very significant sign and probably most significant at all uh, of all, and I suspect this group's very well aware, is the extension of Russia's joint strategic early warning uh, to encompass China. That, that seems very symbolic and very significant. Um, there are areas of real and obvious opportunity for them looking ahead. Uh, you know, the integration of integrations, if you will, whatever exactly one belt, one road, or uh, the Belt and Road Initiative or whatever is really supposed to be, and I think it's mostly in the mind of Mr. Xi, uh, it works better if you can connect it with Russia's sphere, right? With the space that Russia tries to define as its version of Eurasia, there's no question that China's system works better in compatibility with rather than in rivalry with or separate from the Russian system. And there's increasing movement in that direction. Uh, Russia is still respected. I have asked senior Chinese Communist Party apparatchiks this question multiple times. They, at least formally, they still respect and acknowledge Russia's kind of political and security role as guarantor in Central Asia, avoiding the nightmare scenario that a lot of people in Washington like to cite as being the reason why Russia and China can never really be allies, because they'll fight over Central Asia. Well, guess what? By that very same logic, if they don't fight over Central Asia, you just agree that they will be allies, right? Which is a pretty scary prospect if you're the United States. Um, there's a kind of ironic, uh, you know, asymptotal movement on, on military technology, which is the more advanced technology China has, uh, the less disadvantageous it is to Russia to supply China with more advanced technology. In other words, the closer they become to being real peers technologically, uh, the more they can trade and the more freely they can do so. Um, and in the global finance and trading system, due to the sanctions, as already mentioned, uh, more and more you're seeing transactions between Russia and China that do not involve the US dollar or even the euro. Um, and, and really, Russia sanctions have been a, a, an object lesson for China. Uh, they're watching very closely and they're learning that lesson well. Again, don't overstate this as an alliance. The Russian phrasing is key, never against each other, but not necessarily always together. That, that credit to uh, Dmitry Trenin, I believe. 
um, and yet very clearly aimed at the United States, right? There's a basic agreement between Moscow and Beijing about the need to contain American power and influence. And for the first time at Valdai about a month and a half ago, Vladimir Putin rolled out the statement uh, or the, the term military alliance uh, commenting on China for the very first time. So watch this space. Um, in terms of European security, you know, there, there's a ton we could discuss here and it's very fast moving. Uh, I, I talked with uh, Mike Albertson before this uh, presentation. We agreed not to focus on what's going on at this moment in Belarus and Karabakh, et cetera, because it was moving so fast. Um, but suffice to say, it would be it would be equally incorrect to, su to suggest that the local factors that have driven each of those conflicts are not crucial to those conflicts, as it would be to say that the background of U.S.-Russia conflict does not shape those in geopolitical ways. And I think that that's even true of Belarus today. Um, it is certainly true of Ukraine, uh, right, where Ukraine has itself uh, in, in a kind of tragic homage to the uh, etymological origins of its name, Ukraina, on the border, become effectively, even though I myself, when I teach uh, a Ukraine class for over a decade to university students, I oppose the term the borderland, right, because I think it's a, an inadequate encapsulation of everything that is Ukraine. And yet, for geopolitical purposes, that, in effect, is exactly what Ukraine has become uh, and certainly is a proxy conflict. Um, if you think about uh, Nord Stream 2, uh, from, from the German perspective, it's very much about German energy security. It's about Germany's ability to kind of, uh, you know, sit at the center, uh, the hub, if you will, of the wagon wheel of European energy supplies. Uh, but seen from the Russian and the U.S. perspective, it's a geopolitical project. It's a, geo it's a geopolitical fight uh, as to who is going to control Europe's access to energy. Uh, Belarus, you know, very, very um, concerning. Uh, it's not a great word, as my, my former boss and mentor, Jim Collins, always said, concern is not a policy. Uh, I'm not sure we have much more of a policy than concern at this point about Belarus, but suffice to say, uh, it could get really bad, um, and especially uh, if, if from our side, we conclude that there's a win to be had here by outmaneuvering Moscow, right? Um, you know, if we, if we like the outcome in Ukraine, you know, great, try it again in Belarus, except in Belarus, Moscow holds even more of the cards uh, than in Ukraine. And I would argue the outcome in Ukraine hasn't been so great. Uh, and we're watching the fallout from that right now. Um, and then I think the, the biggest concern here is the damage, the long-term damage to the post-Cold War European project uh, which was very much about, you know, avoiding the next major European war that turns into a world war. Um, if you look at the European reaction uh, to both the United States and Russia, right, and also China, you know, this sort of great power competition triangle nowadays, it's very troubling. And I'm quoting you here from uh, the European Council on Foreign Relations, a study which was sponsored by the German foreign ministry, right, our very close allies, uh, quote, powerful countries ranging from China to Europe's ally, the United States, are increasingly reverting to economic punishment and blackmail to change the behavior of European entities, be they the EU member states' governments or businesses. Uh, and they recommend, among other steps, bulking up e the EU's, quote, economic sovereignty. Uh, there's pressure, as we've seen from both sides on NATO, uh, you know, Washington pushing for more NATO spending, not a Trump position exclusively, right? Obama pushed for it. I, I expect Biden would push for it, too. Uh, while Russia is increasingly calling NATO's bluff with near misses and new deployments and so on. Um, so this vision that dates back to the European coal and steel community of the European space being about avoiding a future war, avo avoiding the rise of nationalism, obsessions with sovereignty, uh, this is falling apart. The wheels are coming off of this uh, as Washington de facto abandons the post-1989 goal of a Europe whole and free uh, and accepts a new divide under the moniker of great power competition. Uh, obviously a lot more to unpack there. I feel like with this group, in the interest of time, I don't have to say a lot about the arms control and non-proliferation agenda, uh, only to say, you know, look, INF is clearly dead. Um, the question of uh, whether we can regionalize and restore some kind of future deal, I think is, is an open one. I will say that yesterday I hosted a panel discussion uh, with Sergei Rabkov, the uh, deputy foreign minister in Russia responsible for uh, nuclear issues in North America, and uh, Rose Gottemuller, who's a, a neighbor right there uh, over in the South Bay. Uh, and uh, th this was, let's say, uh, not a productive lane for conversation. Uh, we just get, went right back to trading accusations, 
uh, about, you know, we, we believe they're in violation. Uh, you know, they're willing to consider uh, potentially limiting deployments, but they absolutely deny uh, what we perceive to be open and obvious facts. Uh, although New START extension appears very likely with uh, the arrival of a Biden administration in January, uh, it's by no means a foregone conclusion. Uh, we don't know for sure that it'll be extended for five years. And it's an open question as to, well, what happens in the interim, right? Are we prepared to do something modest, like just slightly tweak down the numbers, uh, something a little more ambitious, like shift to just total warhead count rather than deployed, not deployed, delivery vehicles, blah, blah, blah. Uh, or do we, in fact, have to go for the whole enchilada, which uh, Deputy Minister Rabkov said very clearly yesterday, uh, ain't going to happen. Uh, and that's multilateralized arms control. Uh, he had a sort of more, you know, longer winded, more pragmatic answer than that, but but suffice to say, he did interestingly uh, bring up the incidents at sea agreement from 1972 and the need to kind of update our incident management uh, uh, stability agreements. I think that's important. Um, and then obviously the open skies treaties sort of gone out the window at this point uh, and the cyber dialogue, if there is any, maybe some of you know, I'm not aware of it, uh, you know, it, it's not happening. So some of the, the kind of quintessentially uh, old issues that are new again, and some of the new issues that are compelling now are simply not being addressed in strategic stability dialogue between the United States and the Russian Federation. Um, the basic problem here, I would submit to you, it's actually not the lack of a kind of technical expert level dialogue. The basic problem is that we lack an agreement in principle between Moscow and Washington uh, that we each have a stake in one another's stability. And what I mean by that's very simple. From the Russian side, uh, they believe now that anything that weakens American power and American credibility is good for Russia. Uh, and that can include taking down an American president, taking down an American election, right? Those are quintessentially destabilizing actions. Uh, I think from the U.S. side, many people, I am not among them, but many people believe that if we can help to deliver a future for Russia without Putin, right, what many call a future Russia, an other Russia, a better Russia, right? If that is the aim of U.S. policy, uh, it will be better for U.S. national interests. Whether that's true or not, as a matter of policy, it leads to utter disaster. It is a destabilizing policy. So, so I think without a, an agreement in principle on that, you can't have anything like detente. And without detente, you can't have an atmosphere in which you can negotiate the kinds of things uh, that we have done in the past. So let me end on this. Uh, what, what can we do about it? Um, a student from a small former Soviet country recently asked me in a lecture, uh, could foreign policy bring a divided America back together? Um, and I said, probably not, because America is both blessed and cursed by our wealth and our security. Uh, no external enemy can really be threatening enough, at least not perceived as such in our minds, to matter viscerally to Americans every day the way that, for example, Russia matters to Georgians, which is what this girl had in mind. Uh, what that means is, and you can see these kind of fantasy screenshots of, you know, what Russia invading Canada and America, we come together and Venezuela mating, <laughs> invading the Southeastern United States, right? And this, this is literally the stuff of computer games. Uh, we actually have to solve our own problems at home uh, first for our own reasons in order to restore our strength and credibility in the world not the other way around, not fight a foreign war, rally around the flag at home and hope we can fix our divided America. Uh, George F. Kennan, the namesake and co-founder of my institute, I think had it right. Uh, going back 70 years, he wrote in the long telegram, and I quote, we must formulate and put forward for other nations a much more positive and constructive picture of the sort of world we'd like to see than we have done in the past. Europeans, and here, by the way, one might add Americans as well, are tired and frightened by experiences of the past and are less interested in abstract freedom than in security. It's about the degree to which the United States can create among the peoples of the world generally the impression of a country which knows what it wants, is coping successfully with the problems of its internal life and the responsibilities of a world power, and which has a spiritual vitality capable of holding its own among the major ideological currents of the time. Surely, he concludes, there was never a fairer test of national quality than this. In the light of these circumstances, the thoughtful observer of Russian-American relations will find no cause for complaint in the Kremlin's challenge to American society. And, uh, you know, Brad, if I concluded my 2016 uh, talk for you guys with that same extended quotation, uh, I apologize, but I love it so much. I, I almost had a bust of George Kennan made for the Kennan Institute with this quotation inscribed on it. So uh, I'll end there and happy to take questions. 
Thank you, Matt. And, and excellent um, set of remarks and, and finishing point.